uh, as you probably know, my basic attitude is I do not have all of the answers and I do not know everything, in spite of what I've told my grandchildren. Uh, it, it's just, I probably know more about this than you do, and I recognize it's a difficult subject, so I have a tendency to present this material differently than that I would actually present a gospel lesson. That's the way people would think about it. I have a tendency to do expository lessons that are simply based on the scriptures themselves. Uh, this is a really different subject. People, Lots of people have lost their faith over this one, and I don't believe there's really any in, in between when you either have your faith or you don't have your faith. And if you don't have your faith in God, then you're really putting your faith in natural selection. I mean, in general evolution and, and man, man's thinking. And I wish I could talk about some of that. Sometime, if we have a little bit of time, just ask me. We'll talk a bit about this concept of uh, absolute good and evil, which is the way I always started my honors classes. I just would say, oh, I forgot my coffee. You all talk about make a list of absolute goods and absolute evils. I would come back and they'd be arguing and there'd be nothing on the board because they've not been taught to think outside of being relative. You know, what you think, what I think, it's all relative. I'm okay, you're okay. It's that kind of thinking. Okay, let me just do a little bit of a review for last time. If you weren't here, I'm sorry. Each of these lessons kind of flows from one to the other, and I can't help that. Uh, at some point, uh, you'll understand that when you have six or seven or eight different things that are presented as evidence for general evolution, you can't do that in one night. Well, I could do that in one night, but if any of you are named Eutychus, we would have a problem. Mm -hmm. So I just want you to understand, I have to flow with this. Last time we talked about the difference between general and special evolution and the fact that there is a difference. Because most textbooks, including our own textbooks on the Bible, have what the Bible says, and then many times it has our own interpretation wrapped around it. Well, that's true particularly uh, in the sciences, really every field of uh, study. The books will always have the factual material, but wrapped around them in the text will be the faith or the position that people hold. I mean, you know, it just you think about the the way the different channels talk about events in the United States or politics in the United States. There's some line of truth that may be there, but then the interpretation from the red or the blue tends to get in there. So uh, what I want students to understand is that when they're reading about this, if they can learn to make a distinction between, well, what is the evidence that's being presented, and then what's the interpretation? And remember that you're doing the same thing in your own life. We all do it. All right. The other thing is that, that both of these concepts here, uh, whether you believe in a natural creation <clears throat> or a supernatural creation, they pretty much lie outside of the realm of science. You can't prove it one way or the other. When it comes back to life from non-life, it's never been proven. I don't believe it'll ever be proven because even if we did an experiment that allowed us to think that way, it would have been intelligence working on matter to do that. And, that, and basically, you're right back to my position. So even, even what we believe uh, in supernatural creation, which simply means there's something outside the natural system that played the part. The natural system was brought into existence by God, and the miracles of the Bible were just instances where God brought another uh, force into the equation. For the physicists and the uh, people who think like that, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Uh, it's just Jesus was real, the water was real, the air was real, his feet were real, but God brought something into that situation to where he could walk on the water. And, and that's, that's really the same thing. The jars were real, the water was real, the wine was real. The way it happened was a miracle. God put his own stamp on it. So <clears throat> um, 
we talked about this. These were the evidences that were brought to me in my advanced evolutionary theory class. We talked about comparative anatomy and physiology and morphology last time because there is this incredible similarity in all sorts of living things. And uh, we, we didn't really finish that whole thought, which I didn't want to go too long, and I'll come back to that. Tonight, I really want to deal with the genetics. Anyway, the genetics section is what we want to talk about because in genetics, we actually see the example of natural selection as it is presented in the Bible. And that is the part of evolution that I have no problem with. The idea of the amoeba to man, which is kind of one step above non-life to life, the amoeba to man kind of sequence, the general evolution, is where I have a great deal of difficulty. And I, I don't think I'm the only one. Um, on the other hand, the idea that <laughs> things can change within limits uh, is certainly taught in the Bible. All right. Not unlimited change, but limited change. And that's where we're going to go today. And I want to show you that you already believe natural selection. You probably just don't know it. So you have to separate general evolution from special evolution from chemical evolution, because those are three different concepts, one of which you believe, which is why I started last time with how would you answer this question? Are you an evolutionist or a creationist? And of course, the answer, the answer was, yes. yes, you are. All right. The problem with that statement is they have written that statement as an either or statement. You know, they just made an either or. And sometimes there are questions that you can't answer with a yes or a no. And, I, and there's a lot of things I could get into. I'm not going to. So we're going to start right here uh, this time. The evidence from uh, genetics is pretty simple. That when you look at animals uh, that reproduce sexually, you're going to find that no two, except identical twins, no two are exactly alike. They're not identical. Okay. I mean, they're not, no two are exactly alike except for <laughs> identical twins. The individuals in all the species will vary in their size, their proportions, coloration, uh, external and internal structure, and their physiology and even their way of living. All right. But there's this great similarity there that we talked about last time. Uh, changes in the genetic uh, genetics of an organism may be due to new combinations of genes or alleles. It could be just to a mutation from radiation in the environment. It could be uh, due to point mutations, what they call gene mutations, or it can just be chromosome breaks and it flips over. And so the sequence is just backwards. So those are the things. Now, without going into all of this, most people, if you read this, you realize that there is a particular theory of evolution that's being talked about here. If you scan it fast, can you tell me which one it is of the three we're talking about? Hmm? Yeah. It's the general theory, isn't it? All right, so basically the idea that the general evolution of the animal and plant world is considered by all those entitled to judgment, which I think leaves me out, uh, to be a fact for which no further proof is needed. All right. Well, there's no distinction between general, special, or chemical evolution. So let's move on to the next one. This is Herman Mueller. He's the Nobel Prize winning uh, geneticist. And there he goes. There's no hypothesis alternative to the principle of evolution with its tree of life that any, com well, that leaves me out too, competent biologist of today take seriously. And so he, he just goes on. It's established even like the roundness of the earth. Another big word, rotundity. <laughs> you don't have to go and look that one up. <laughs> we were talking about words before. So you've got two statements of general evolution. When you come down to Darwin, you have this concept of natural selection. His classic example were these finches in the Galapagos Islands. And without getting into more detail about the Galapagos, basically they're little volcanic islands uh, where there's a separation of distance between these uh, these various species. 
And so his whole concept of general evolution was based on this natural selection of these species here. I have no real problem with it. One of the things I've done in all of my lessons is to basically just grant it as though it's completely true. I don't get into an argument about it, but the point is there's another way to look at this that does not violate the scriptures, which is far more important to us than argument. We just need to think about how, what the scriptures say. So basically, common ancestor, you know, coming up to, we don't have this, by the way, coming up to a warbler or a large ground finch or a medium ground finch, in some place there has to be a small ground finch, a woodpecker finch, and so on. Most of the differences are in the beak. You know, some eat very uh, small seeds and some can eat big seeds because they have these really pincher type, you know, much more uh, power in their beak. So uh, we know about peppered moths. I'm not going to use that example. Most people have dealt with it. But we have we have had a shift in the number of peppered moths uh, since the Industrial Revolution in England. So there used to be uh, almost all peppered. I don't know whether you can see the peppered moth there, but it blends in. Kids, what's that called? Do you remember what that's called? Camouflage, Camouflage or protective coloration. <laughs> Great. Um, and some place in there is probably a tree stand and a rifle. That, Never mind. <laughs> anyway, the point on this is that uh, we have camouflage of the, this one against the normal tree, which had lichens growing all over it. After the Industrial Revolution, just the coal dust darkened all the trees. It killed off the uh, uh, killed off the lichens, and you end up with this other one, which is a black one, becoming the predominant uh, the predominant coloration in this particular species. Well, now we've never gotten two species from this, but you don't need to get into that argument. That's not the point. So I'll grant the fact that there was a change from 95% uh, this and 5% that to 95% this and 5% that. Never have gotten two new species, and that's where people tend to, to focus in. But I think you could. If you separated them by distance, I think over time you get two new species. For instance, there's a, a tern. It's a type of seabird, and it goes all the way around the Arctic. And where that population begins, if you go all the way around the Earth and come back to here, the ones here won't breed with these two. So at the ends of that, what we call a cline of a population, you have two different species. So you can just imagine cutting that in half by something and you've got two new species. That's fine. So that would prove natural selection. And I think I can show you some other stuff too, but the Bible talks about it and I need to get to that. Uh, we've already talked about this idea of changes uh, within uh, organisms. The wild mustard, mustard gave, us, gave rise to everything I don't like basically. But every one of those plants, you know, genetically came from the wild mustard plant. And that would be natural selection. In, a, in this case, it would be artificial selection. So let's go on through these. This is really the idea of the horses going from a small dawn horse up to a, a large horse. However, I think that most of you know that we have uh, Belgiums and uh, Clydesdales, which are huge. I've I've been in a stall with a Belgian, and I was afraid to move. I couldn't see. This is his back. I couldn't see over this thing, you know, which was disturbing. Although, I finally realized that I could run under it <laughs> to try to get out of there. I was short enough to run under it. And we have these little tiny, uh, mi just miniature pygmy horses that, that aren't this tall. And you put those two against one another. If you put them in the fossil record, do you think they would be viewed as two species? Maybe two genera, and yet it's all one species. It's a modern species of horse. It's just been genetically modified. So we know that that can happen here. I don't know why we do that, uh, but in horse, I mean in dogs, I'm not really sure why we do that, because we end up with chihuahuas, which are really high-pitched rat, you know. <laughs> I know people like them, but they irritate me. 
Anyway, so we have lots of, give me a good Collie Shepherd anytime. We have lots of different dogs. That's artificial selection. So I want you to recognize that that term is very similar to natural selection. So the question is, can in nature, can you have a natural selection like artificial selection? I believe you can, but I believe there are limitations. Anybody who knows anything about breeding, like cattle or horses, knows that you can push it just so far before the change slows down and you couldn't put them out in the wild without them either dying out or snapping back. So it's like they're on a bungee cord. Does that make sense? The genetics are like a bungee cord. You can stretch it so far and, you know, they either die or they snap back. When you put them in the wild, you can keep them like this artificially. All right, so well, let's go through this. Oh, by the way, this is a, an extinct muck ox, and this is one that some Russian geneticists took modern breeds of cattle, and they went back and produced it. Well, I think that looks a lot like that muck ox. I wouldn't argue with that, but that's just change within limits, and that's going to be the difference. You can change it, even a new species sometimes, but always within limits. And I'm going to show you in the Bible that when the Bible talks about kinds, that's the difference. The Bible never talks about species. It says that God created everything after its own kind. And I can show you uh, in a minute that that could be a single species like us, but it could also be a super family or it could be a genus. You know, uh, it, and if that's true, it solves a bunch of problems. Number one, it would explain that species were not created as they are and where they are, which has been a consistent argument among creationists, that no changes could take place from the creation. That answers that problem, and it answers the problems of uh, how Noah got all of the animals on the ark. He didn't have to take two of every species, had to take two of every kind. doesn't say anything about whether they had to be adults. I'm pretty sure God was working there. I think there was a, there was a miraculous element to that whole story, and you can't take that out, by the way. So uh, I don't need to go through that. You don't need to know what that was. It isn't a Darwin versus the Bible thing, and that's where people get into problem. Uh, there, this misconception came out in an American biology teacher. It's sort of like Scientific American for high school uh, teachers. And what this guy did is, you know, he made this statement, and he said, creation means no new forms appear after the date of creation, shouldn't have any differences. See, that's the very thought that people have about creationism. <clears throat> so he drew this in that particular issue, and this was his thing. This is creationism in the fossil record. This is what we see in the fossil record, and this is wrong, and this is what we see, so this is wrong. You know, the idea of no changes from the time of the creation, not in different places on the earth, okay? So uh, I just, that all goes back to a religious, highly religious Christian. You need to understand where this came from. It didn't come from an evolutionist. This concept that led to all of that came from a Christian who misinterpreted the scriptures. So if you want an example of what happens when you take something simple in the Bible and you interpret in a way, um, if you interpret it in a way, you have to be careful. You cannot put something in there that is not there. You know, Linnaeus, who ended up being the father of modern taxonomy, in classification systems. Linnaeus was the one who said species were, were immutable. So a creationist said species were immutable. Darwin came along and showed that they weren't. End of story. Creationism was wrong. Evolution was true. Either or, right? So everything about that was an either or comment. But I want you to notice the biblical kind, obviously, ooh, that didn't turn out very good. Um, you know, we know that we know basically that mankind, and that's a word even that everybody everybody uses it, whether they believe in God or not. It's a biblical concept that man is a kind and we are a species. Okay, and I think that was part of what Linnaeus was looking at. But you'll notice 
that in uh, Genesis 1.25, it says cattle after their kind, they are at a they are at a genus level. There are many different species of cattle that are absolutely different species. So it's like above that. It's not species, but it's above that. All of cattle are basically uh, included in this, and there's a bunch of different species. Not with man. One species, we're a kind. But with cattle, uh, that's where they are, the cuckoo and the hawk. The hawk is actually at the super family level, which means it has families of hawks underneath it. Each family has uh, many orders and genera and species. So the kind is the kind is not a species except in man. All right. So you can go through these things and you'll see that that's true. So uh, it solves it does solve a lot of problems. And I'll come back to that in, when we're talking about theistic evolution and from a biblical point of view, why it is so many people take that view. OK, it is one that eventually people who take that view will not be able to teach in a university. You're either going to be a general evolutionist or you ain't going to be there. They've already done that with people they think at least are creationists. I mean, I had a lot of good friends who believed in, in uh, general evolution who were very, very respectful to me, including many of my professors. There were others who tried to get me <laughs> to not be able to get ten tenure on the basis of what they thought my beliefs were, none of them having ever talked to me. So they just made an assumption that I was teaching what most, uh, most creationists teach, and I'm not. But they never came and asked. So I had to write a letter to an entire department so that when they were talking about me in their, uh, in their retreat, that they would have this letter in which I say, none of you have talked to me. You don't know what I believe. And if you'd like to know, please come and talk to me. And that ended that. I got tenure and I ended it by being nice to them. I didn't fight. I just said, hey, I think you're making a mistake here. So anyway, um, so the, the class is above the order, which is above the family, which is above a genus and above a species, mankind at the species level, cattle, hawks at the super uh, at the super order or super family level. It's right, really right in between there. So the kind doesn't represent one thing. So it's possible for things to produce different species within the genetics of the kind. And that is actually in the scriptures. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Uh, Old Testament writers had a pretty sophisticated understanding of artificial selection. And if you go to the details of the story about Jacob and Laban, you will see that uh, Jacob re recognized that God was performing a miracle with his flocks. No doubt about that. Anybody disagree with that one? Jacob understood there was a miracle going on because every time... Laban changed the wages and changed what he had in his flock. His flourished, Laban's didn't. And if he knew that that was wrong, what was it wrong to? What he already knew naturally, right? It shouldn't have been that way. So unless you have a concept of the natural order, you won't recognize a miracle. <laughs> so he knew God was with him. All right. And he, if you read that, you'll find that even though it sounds rather weird about going up uh, to the stakes, there was a concept of, uh, of natural selection in there, that you could change organisms by selecting for certain characteristics. We do that in horses, and then sometimes we're really surprised. Most of you know that these uh, finely genetically tuned uh, racehorses could not live in the wild. They just can't. Uh, they're either going to come back to the sort of the normal form or they're just going to die. And so we found a horse that died on the track in the Kentucky Derby because its its ankles were too thin and it, they just both snapped while it was running and they had to put it down. 
and one that got on the back stretch and they found out it was a bleeder. They had not realized it was a bleeder. They had to put it down. That's because they have stretched it as far as they can go. All right. Now, I do believe that in natural selection, you'll see that you actually believe that. So this is the same book with this sophistication. It's the same book that introduces us to the concept of God's abrupt creation and the destruction of a world by of the world by a flood. So if you want to say, oh, those are just stories, I want you to remember that the details here show natural selection, long before anybody who is a scientist ever said anything about it. And it talks about the fact that this was observable to Laban because he knew enough about flocks as a breeder to know he was not getting the right proportions. There had to be a miracle going on. Does it make sense to you? Okay, cool. Uh, this is what I believe. Uh, I believe that mankind is a kind. There's ape kind, cow kind, horse kind, bird kind. So I believe in the special theory that thing, change can come within limitations, and I believe there was a supernatural creation. Now, this is all we ever see is the tips and nodes of the branches. I'll get back into that when I talk about geology, but this would be present day, the tips and the nodes of the branches. That's all we see, and in the fossil record, sometimes we see what appear to be connections, all right? This is the concept of the general theory that non-life became life, and from that one life, everything else came. Now, sometimes they focus on things like reptiles becoming birds, which we'll talk about in the, the geology or paleontology uh, section, and I'll show you why that can't be. It's not that hard to show uh, how unreasonable it is. Uh, but the idea that Reptiles became birds, it also means that reptiles became butterflies. And if you look at the sequences, you need to recognize all the, every insect, every butterfly, birds, all of these things would have to have come from reptiles. So you really begin to spread that whole concept out when you realize what they're saying. Now, I, I love Gary Larson because he makes me laugh. This this is really the concept you get into sometimes. It's like, okay, these things changed, and the, in the middle there was some kind of unique change in natural selection. Now, I mean, I would have called it a miracle, but you know, there's kind of a gap there in our knowledge. But you know, I laugh at everything that he does. The idea of coming from the water and becoming a land organism, I don't think so personally from the ones they've given. But this is funny to me. Here's the cheetah putting on his new Nikes to chase the antelopes. At, what this points out to, to me is in the cartoons, it's always an individual organism that's evolving. And that can't happen. It has to be a population. Within the population of humans, no two are exactly alike except identical twins. I said it right that time, didn't I? Anyway, stop laughing at me, man. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I just want you to understand that in a population, we have lots of different characteristics, and under certain environmental differences, all right, you may have a characteristic that allows you to live long enough to have children that I don't have, all right? And right now, everybody's worried about this concept of why we have so much autism or why did we have this disease and so on. Well, if you stop and think about our grandparents, my grandfather on my mom's side was born in 1873. I knew him for quite a while till 71. I was born in 45. So he was 97 and a half years old. He didn't have immunizations. He didn't have antibiotics. He was one of the half of the family that lived, but most women lost half their children by the age of 10. So those were the ones that lived and passed their genetics on. That's natural selection. And I'm hoping that I got those genes, all right? But Darlene doesn't like me wearing jeans, so. <laughs> I'm making fun of her because it's fun. <laughs> Isn't this a nice coat? <coughs> Why did I wear it? Darlene was coming with me, and she bought it for me. So anyway, the point is, that genetically, uh, there are these differences, 
and with the differences, uh, there's this opportunity to have some difference allow you to live instead of die and live to have offspring so that you can pass that on. So most people who came from that generation that came out of the late 1800s, uh, those people, uh, many of them died after childbirth, but a woman would lose half of her children. So the genetics were stronger for just living without antibiotics and living without having immunizations. And we don't have that. I should have died. I always ask my honor students after we talked about this, I said, how many of you think you would have made it, you know, back in the good old days? You know how people are always wanting to go back to the good old days? No, you don't. Okay. You don't want to go back there where you dig your own privy every day. Uh, it, the, the diseases that were there were killing off people so fast. And when we developed antibiotics is when I was born. So I had some immunizations and antibiotics from the time I was born in 1945. However, I was very, very sick. And had I not had the antibiotics, I would have died a number of times. Okay, so that's part of the problem we're having now. We have a lot of people living who've been kept alive by immunizations and antibiotics. And so I think we're seeing more problems uh, uh, in, the, in their health. <coughs> So the major misconception about natural selection is that in, 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 individual organisms can evolve, but only populations can actually change. And I'll show you that you do believe that. Uh, here's Darwin's concept of natural selection. It's split up into five simple things. Organisms tend to multiply in a population geometrically. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. Okay? Uh, and then they tend to level out. But, and what we found, all these people that I know that have gone into, uh, gone into the field as biologists, if you do the studies, you'll find out that it, the number of individuals in a population, except five in the United States, like alligators and turkeys and foxes, uh, remain pretty, pretty constant. So what you have is this exponential growth and then it levels out. Well, now we give names to that kind of stuff, okay? This is exponential growth, like this. It's like an acceleration curve. You start out, then you go a little faster. It's easier to go a little faster, a little faster, a little faster. And then you slow down when you see the policeman. <laughs> All right, so there is a reason for that. This number of individuals remains remarkably constant because there's you can only you can only sustain a certain number of individuals in a population okay so what you find is that this exponential growth curve comes up and even though it kind of wavers around that line at first it comes to the uh carrying capacity that's all you can get in there you can't have any more all right so you you start out like gangbusters and then uh not enough food not enough places to live disease things you know, like that, and it levels out. So it's like you start out, and you know, get up to 120, and then you see the policeman, and it levels out right there. Anyway, carrying capacity. So there's a couple of terms here that are actually helpful to you. One is that you have this acceleration growth curve. You probably can remember that term. And then secondly, it can't sustain all the individuals that could come from that. You know, because if you took one female cockroach who gave birth to uh, 50 eggs and baby cockroaches, I think it's just 750 years before you would have uh, like 8 billion. I mean, and you just can't do that. As many as there are, there's still a limit. I do want to tell you there is a university that has a cockroach room. And what they've done is they've provided all the space they need They've provided all the food they need, and the entire room, inside and out, of they made it as a kitchen, by the way. I'm not sure why they made it as a kitchen. But inside and outside the cabinets, on every surface is a cockroach. It is completely, it's a kitchen made out of cockroaches, basically. And I know that's gross to you, but I do want you to remember that cockroaches are cleaner than flies. 
you know, I'm thinking about a picnic right at the moment. Okay. So anyway, so there's where we're going. Uh, so we have organisms tending to multiply at a geometric rate. Uh, and then in a population, the number of individuals will remain remarkably constant. So if you put those two curves together, you realize that there has to be something that's causing the struggle between the individuals. That creates a struggle for survival. And then these variations exist among the different members. You know, genetically, no two individuals are exactly alike. So the individuals that have the most favorable genetics or variations will survive to produce offspring, and that's natural selection. So do you actually believe that? Well, this is all the people in the world. Well, it's not. There's like 200 races. We don't like to use the word races anymore, but there are 200 recognized races more than 200 actually. We're all the same, but we're different. So the, the only way I can figure that this came about was through movement through different environments and circumstances and certain certain factors were selected for and that was it. So where do we go? Well, I don't want to deal with Darwin right now. Oh yes, I do. <laughs> This is what Darwin and, nat and, and natural selection have always said, that the reason that giraffes got longer and longer necks was because of the lack of food during the dry season. And so the ones with the longest necks were the ones that lived through those dry seasons, and they just got longer and longer and longer. Now, that meant that there were long-necked giraffes in there already, and there were short-necked giraffes, but the short-necked short -neck giraffes didn't have enough food. So that's why he did it this way. Here's a long, come on, sorry, sorry, sorry. Here, here's a long-necked giraffe in a population with many different lengths, but here's a small-necked giraffe. And then this is the one that survives, and over time, even though there may be periods without starvation, the long-necked giraffes, every time all those leaves go away, because they feed entirely off the leaves and the trees, the necks get longer. Now, here's the difference in the way I approach this. I'm willing to grant that. But many people would argue, uh, many people would argue over this whole concept that we know that baby giraffes feed themselves. That's a significant comment. That means they should die because they can't reach the leaves. The parents should get the, the parents do not feed the young. They feed themselves. And that's a significant, significant point to make. But to me, that gets you off on a sidetrack. So let's just look at the big picture here. This fits, uh, that fits the, that fits the evidence, excuse me. That fits the evidence that I know that there are long sorry there are long necked and there are short necked giraffes in a population so i usually just grant that this happens i have no problem with that because i don't want to argue about this other one which actually to many people is a stronger argument for us the babies don't feed themselves so where am i going with this there are other ways to explain the evidence by the way when you put a far side up there, that's actually a joke. And I don't mind if you laugh, but you can tell me later you just didn't get it. That's all right. <laughs> so let's look at something we do know. So here we're going to go back to our cockroaches. Within the population of cockroaches, there is one or a few that are resistant to the insecticide we're using. The others are all killed by it. So you spray it. You have a survivor that has the gene that's resistant to the uh, pesticide. And the survivor produces a new population. So you're going to have to either put additional uh, applications, but I think you're really going to have to create a new pesticide. And that same thing is going on in the hospitals right now. And most of us recognize that there are bacteria that keep changing every time we put antibiotics out there. And then we have to create another last resort antibiotic. When Jonathan had, Jonathan's our son, and when he had spinal meningitis, 
We really did not think it was uh, contagious, but they had to be sure. We thought it was a uh, we thought it was bacterial, and it, was, and it wasn't a virus itself. So he had to take these medicines. There were two uh, antibiotics that they would only give in a hospital at that time. One was robocephin and one was vancomycin, I believe. You had to have them given in a hospital through a PIC-2. That was it. Nobody else. You couldn't take those at home. You had to be able to finish them, and they had to be given to you and administered in the hospital. They were the last resort for anybody who had a bacterial disease. Now, you can buy them over the counter, practically. Well, you have to get them as a prescription, but you can take them home and take them. They are not the last resort. They're good, but they've created other antibiotics that are the last resort that have to be given in the hospitals. And I don't know the names of those, I'm sorry. So we find certain bacteria, this is a bacterium now, forget the legs. Here's a bacterium that is resistant to some kind of uh, antibiotic. And so most of the population is killed by the antibiotic, but this one isn't. And then it produces a new population that is resistant to it. Does that make sense? You believe that's happening? That's natural selection. That's all it is. Now, what's the difference between natural selection and general evolution? It is the idea of changes within limits and changes with no limits. And at this point, the breeders, nobody dealing with artificial selection has ever shown that you can go past a certain point of change with these organisms. You can push them to a certain point, then they're either going to snap back or die. So there's nothing that actually supports the concept of unlimited change in organisms so that you can go from the non-living to the living to the single cell multicellular you know amphibians fish reptiles i mean you don't have that from this but you still have natural selection you still get new species within the kinds all right so we come back to this we basically see that if if these organisms and these these every one of these finches they live in really severe um they re really live in very severe environmental conditions it's kind of uh, abundance and scarcity it's either very dry or it's very lush and it'll be the same way during the dry season and the wet season on every one of these islands so there was one couple who did a study for 25 years. They were married. Those scientists for 25 years went every year to gather information on only two finches. There were only two finches on this one island called Daphne. Almost, in, there were only one place they could actually get on the island. There was, you couldn't just jump out on the beach kind of thing. There were no beaches. So there's just one place where they could pull a boat up and they could get out. They'd stay there for weeks at a time. And they take all of this data down. What they found was that the variations within the size of the populations varied totally on the basis of the amount of uh, moisture because when it was scarce, there were really small seeds, and that was uh, beneficial to the small beaked ones. But when the large seeds were there in the abundance, uh, that favored the ones with the big beaks that had so much more power. Now, you, in that case, you still have those two species there. You know, nothing's changed on that. However, that is the whole concept. So if that happened between two islands, one of them might actually disappear and the other one stay. So that would be a mechanism for getting the different 13 species. Now, this is another case where some people get off and they argue about the 13 species. No, there aren't 13 species. So they're basically arguing about what we found rather than recognize what the real issue is. The real issue is that some kind of change within limits occurs. They need to get back on track and talk about whether you can have change, genetic change, unlimited, which you would need for general evolution. So I know this seems very scientific to you, I hope. But the special theory is that 
uh, and this, I think I mentioned this before, G.A. Kirkcutt was the general editor of a zoology, a series of monographs on pure and applied biology. And so this is out of a scientific book he wrote, all right? And he, he identified special and general evolution. Now, he came under an incredible amount of criticism, and they tried to buy all of those books back. I think I have four copies now. They tried to buy all of those books back because this was not good for general evolutionists. But this is true. There's a theory that states that many living animals and plants can be observed over the course of time to undergo changes so that you can get new species. That would be called the special theory of evolution, and it can be demonstrated in certain cases by experiment. I have no problem with that. The general theory uh, says no. The general theory says there is an unlimited amount of change so that what you see up here came from this. We don't have that. But what we see up here came from some kind of limited change within the kinds. You see the difference? Not within species, but within the kinds. Now, what that is, is you have evidence, you have one interpretation, you have another interpretation. When I presented this in my evolutionary, my advanced evolutionary theory class, actually they required me to do this in front of the chair and the graduate students of psychology and biology, which technically is illegal now, but I'm not bothered by that. This is the way I approached it. When I got done, my professor said, I didn't think you could do that. You just showed that it's a matter of faith, not fact. Well, I was happy with that. Now, he went back on that the next day in class. However, he saw it at that point. He never bothered me, by the way, after that. He maybe thought I was a little crazy. <laughs> so do you. But he never really, he never was disrespectful to me after that. And I've had some of the graduate students that were in that class, I've caught up with them, and they've never been disrespectful to me. And some of them are much more conservative in their religious beliefs. So maybe there was some good in all of that. Well, I'm not going to deal with this one, but I want to point out that the issue is not the changes uh, in the frequency in the gene pool. We know that that can happen. The, the real issue is limited versus unlimited genetic change. Now, when Frank Lovell was debating Buddy Payne down in Louisville, this is what Frank said. And Frank's a friend of mine. He is a person who is an absolute atheist. And he went and he actually got into this debate with Buddy. And he said, today we know that mutations can alter species in every imaginable way, imaginable way. Science has not discovered any law of nature that places a limit on the altering effects of mutation. No limit has been discovered. This is right back to the same issue. Is it unlimited change or limited change? Well, to me, it's easier to explain with the limited change and kinds of organisms. So I have no problem with natural selection. I believe it's taught in the Bible. Now, this we'll deal with at a different time. This is the idea of... Uh, general evolution and this is a there's a reason why i use this very old chart because it has some things on here they never put on the charts today which are still true but i think they're very important but they don't put them on the charts today we'll deal with that in the geologic record here's the general theory on the other hand there's a theory that all the living forms in the world have arisen from a single source which itself came from an inorganic or non-living form. This can be called the general theory of evolution. So I didn't write these terms. People have asked me, why do you put the word evolution in there at all? Because I've tried to stick with terms that came out of my books, out of my studies that were written by geologists and biologists and geneticists and so on. I mean, this came from the general editor of the uh, this series of monographs on pure and applied biology. Highly respected at the time. Uh, my friend Steve Wolfgang actually stopped to see him. He was still teaching in England. Uh, and Steve got to talk to him. And he tried to bring this topic up about general and special. And he very 
cleverly sidestepped it through the entire time they were talking. He wanted to talk about his latest piece of research. So I'm, I'm pretty sure he got his hand slapped pretty hard by his colleagues for putting it that way. But I don't know of anything that has answered the seven things he mentions in his book. What, what he offers to support this has never been uh, has never been disproven because he gave an alternate interpretation. And that's what he got slapped down for. You can see what the problem is here. All right, so if you're going to take the facts in biology, this is the only way today that you really are allowed to interpret it. So let me tell you how to deal with this, kids, when you get it in class. Learn everything you can, put down what they want to hear. They just want to know if you know the theory from that point of view. Just put it down. I've only, I've only known of a few people that didn't try to learn it that way, but they were stubborn. This one lady who was a, a wife of, uh, she was just an amazing Christian. She taught Christian women, and she probably was a better preacher than most preachers who are out there. She was an incredible teacher. Anyway, she said she just refused to put that down on her test. But since she had a four point all the way through school, the professor just could not fail her. So he gave her a D. So I, don't, I didn't think it was necessary to do that if you realize what you're dealing with. They give you an interpret the evidence and interpretation from one point of view, and they want to know if you know it. Well, I'm good with that. If as I was going to talk about the current view of premillennialism, I feel like I would have to know a whole lot about all the different views on premillennialism. All right, if I was going to talk about something that a particular do denomination taught that I felt violated the scriptures, I still would have to know a lot about their arguments. So I, I don't think there's anything wrong with actually putting it down on a test. I thought it was kind of sad that somebody who had a four-point approached it differently, but at that time she was older than I am uh, significantly, and she's passed away. I just don't think she felt like she had a choice. Okay, so this general and special terms, those are not mine. They came from a scientist who wrote a book, and he used to challenge his graduate students. The forward to the book is really interesting. He would bring a graduate student in to do an oral exam, and uh, he, he, instead of asking them what the evidence, oh, yeah, he'd say, do you know the evidence for evolution? You know, no modifiers there, just evolution. And they would start to say, and he'd say, well, tell me what the evidence is for uh, for creationism. And they, you know, they, they weren't ready for that one. And so he would make them go out and then write a paper on it. But his book was all about that. He took all of these areas, he gave these two interpretations. And that's, that's really part of the reason that I started doing it this way. So I believe in a supernatural creation where the kinds can change within limits through natural selection or special evolution. I used to be, by the way, first of all, not an atheist, but an agnostic. I had left the church. I'd left all the religious organizations. I didn't care about any of this. You know, I was having a lot of fun. At least I thought it was. And I just didn't care. But at that, when I got into science, I thought, well, I think maybe I just might be a theistic evolutionist. And I talked myself out of that one really fast. And I do a whole lesson. I will be doing an entire lesson for you on why I am not a theistic evolutionist. Why I just realized you're either going to believe that God created or you're going to believe that it happened according to this other interpretation. And I, it's a faith issue. You will never disprove anything or prove anything ultimately. It is a faith issue. You either believe that God created the heavens and the earth or you don't. You either believe that there were miracles that occurred or you don't. And when you take those out of your Bible, you might as well go burn your Bible. It makes no sense whatsoever 
without these interventions by God. Just throw it away. Go out and live the way you want to live. Let Satan tempt you into anything that you want to get into. But if you're going to believe that God is and a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, you better be able to defend your belief, not change everybody, just be able to de defend your particular view of the evidence. Does that all make sense to you? And it wouldn't make any difference whether it was this topic or not. You have a requirement by God to come to a defense of the faith. Okay, giving a reason of, of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. All right, so Darlene always wants me to use this. My friend John Clark put this one together. Emphasize this down here. This is the idea of the special uh, theory, the idea of change and variation within a group, what I call the kind. All right, nothing between them. The general theory basically says change within the group, but then can become another kind, can become another kind, can become another kind. That's that's the basic difference. It's on the bottom line. This is general evolution. This is special evolution. And I have no problem with this. And I've given you the reasons for it. Okay. You know, there's a lot of people who think they're thinking uh, when they're really just rearranging all of their prejudices. We need to be careful. We do not do that. We need to, if somebody offers something you cannot explain, you have a responsibility to decide why you are confused by it. You do not have a right to just walk away. There was an argument between young people and older people in one congregation where I was down in Florida. And this one man, this older man, he was just went off the wall, sort of ballistic. And I was determined to not go home until he and I worked that out. So we sat out in his car for four hours. Would have been a lot easier to just call him a name and go home and be angry with him forever. But we actually worked that out. It just took us four hours to do it. Now, if you don't want to spend that kind of time defending the word, that's fine. I understand that. It's a temptation not to. You're already thinking about the Super Bowl of college football right now, right? Or is it the Super Bowl of pro football? It's college football. You can say it out loud. It's college football, right? I don't know who's playing, but I will when I get home and I see that DVR. That would have been the only reason I didn't come if we didn't have DVRs. <laughs> anyway, uh, unlimited uh, genetic change. That's what he was talking about, Frank. There's just no limit to it. So let's talk for just a second about this. Um, I love uh, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Tell me how they became that. One of you, you young, do you, either of you know what it is? What uh, was it? They had, they put this kind of chemical inside them. Yeah, uh, some kind of ooze in the, uh, in the uh, alleyway or something like that. Uh, we, that's big in, that's big in science fiction, okay? Not good science. Science fiction is fun. I love science fiction. All right. However, sometimes people read science fiction to the point where they think all of that could be true. And if, you, if you're a writer of science fiction and you don't pull that off, you're not a good science fiction writer. You've got to make it believable. All right. So the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are believable to me. Okay. If I take that point of view. We laugh at Gary Larson's uh, cartoon, this idea that somehow you can drink a chemical and you can be mutated. First of all, it's an individual changing. That's not possible, all right? I'm pretty sure that you aren't going to look like this. You're just going to be dead. That's my guess. Same thing you hear. Warning, underground nuclear test area. We don't change, all right? Here's one that they are saying changed. This one changed. This one has three eyes. Yeah, they probably changed, but those are individuals changing. Well, that doesn't, that's not right. Individuals don't change like that. And the idea is that radiation can do this. So we have Superman, was it radiation? The Hulk? Radiation accident. And the, well, I want to tell you, 
Does anybody know when I say fat man and little boy, what that means? You know what it is? Right. It's the two, quote, atomic bombs that we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In that study, they had an accident in the lab, and there was an overexposure to the radiation. No one became Superman. No one became the Hulk. Nobody became a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. They all died. Because radiation exposure like that doesn't make us better. Science fiction can do that, but not the reality. It's fiction. So you take the science, you've got to go back to the science. And that was very sad. I mean, it was a small <coughs> mistake that somebody made, and everybody was exposed, and they all died. All right, it did not make them better. Besides, we could have teenage mutant ninja sea turtles who could clean up the ocean for us. There's an idea for one of y'all. Okay. This is a Formula One race car. The concept of radiation is very simple. You and I are being bombarded by it every day. I mean, we have cells that are, that are being killed and genetics that are being changed in cells all over our body every day just from radiation from the sun, background radiation from radon that's in the rocks, you know, and there's just a lot of different ways for that to happen to us. The idea that mutations help is foreign to reality. <coughs> The fact that you can change something with radiation is ridiculous. It's why in uh, doctors and dentists' office, until they got their new stuff, their new machines, which are digital, the radiation, they had to wear dosimeters on their belts, had to be checked every week, I think, to see if they were getting some unexpected overdose of radiation. And for most people, the greatest source of radiation damage was from going to doctors and dentist offices, the x-ray machines. You know, it didn't have to do with something like that. I want to think of you, I want to think of your body as a Formula One race car. I want to think of my body that way. Anyway, you think of all of the parts that are in there and how finely tuned that thing is. We have 60 trillion cells. You had 3 trillion when you were born. You now have 60 trillion cells. 25, um, uh, yeah, and, the, and there's 25 basic different types of cells, and they're put together into tissues and organs and, uh, and then into the organism. Everything finely tuned. You tweak something over here, it's going to have an effect through the whole body. Most of us recognize our bodies are like that. So we're sort of like the finely tuned Formula One car when you look at us that way. Let's say you take a really high-powered rifle and you shoot it through the engine of that car. What are the chances that you would make it better? Kind of look at it as zilch. I'm pretty sure. You can't even tweak the muffler without stopping that car. Everything has to be exactly the way it is. Now, that's for an individual, and populations can change but they can only change within limits. God set the limits when he set the kinds, and that explains all the evidence. So in the genetics, I just want you to under where we've come from. Now, I just want to give something biblical to you because sometimes people don't want to go through things logically, and at one point I would never have understood this. Jesus claims to be God, God in the flesh. Now, either... His claims are true and he's Lord, and you can accept him or reject him, or his claims were false. And a lot of people think they were false, which means you either have to say they're false and he knew it, or they were false and he didn't know it. If he didn't know it, then he was sincerely deluded or a lunatic. And if he knew it, then he was deliberately misrepresenting truth, which made him a liar and a hypocrite, a demon and a fool. So I would just urge you to go over here and recognize that when the Bible talks about him being born of a virgin, when it talks about him being raised from the dead in three days, 
by his own power, by his own will, that you believe those things. Because the, you might as well throw your Bible out when you don't believe the miracles. You cannot talk about the Bible uh, sincerely, and uh, you cannot give it the credit it's due if you do not believe the miracles. You know, the debate over modern-day miracles is an entirely different thing. But there is no debate over the miracles of the Old and New Testament. Some people believe they've stopped. Some people don't. That's an entirely different debate. But the ones that are written down by God, we have to believe. We simply have to believe them. Or there's no, everything in the Bible is just nonsense. So I just want to close with this. I had a card given to me one time. And it showed all these people on the earth who have claimed to be God. Images of all these despots who, who, basically said, I'm God. They wanted to rule the world. So you got a lot of people who are human who want to say they're God. But there's only one God who ever became human. And without him becoming human and showing us and taking away our last argument, by the way, because our last argument to God is, you just don't know what it's like to live in this body you gave me. And we sort of excuse a lot of error in our lives. And basically, when Jesus came, he got into a body just like ours, with all the same temptations, everything we've ever experienced, everything that anybody has ever experienced. And he lived perfectly, which pretty much takes away my argument that I can't live perfectly in my body. And that was our last argument. So... You either believe it or you don't believe it. And I can't prove it to you. Ultimately, I can't say, there you have it. Scientific fact proves this. Because if I did, then it wouldn't be on the basis of faith. Faith is the stu substance of things we don't see. Right? It is faith. Now, i got to stop. We went 10 minutes longer than we did last time. And I'm sorry for that. Questions? I'll tell you what, if you have questions, write them down. Considering the weather, uh, I'm a little bit worried about everybody going home. Just write a question out for me, legibly. You can use block letters. I don't think they teach cursive anymore. <laughs> so use block letters, and you have some kind of problem psychologically if you use block and cursive mixed. I forget what it is. It's, I'm not joking. I just learned about that today. One of my one of my student friends has it. His mother explained it to me. I said, "Well, I I do my name in cards with both." <laughs> it's like, okay, David, that's called. That was just another.